Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Phil Lotz, and I'm the IC37 class president. I'd like to welcome everyone to the inaugural uh, IC37 webinar, number one. Uh, we're going to start with downwind boat handling. And I'd like to start by uh, welcoming Greg Fisher, our new class coach, and introducing Greg a little bit. Um, Greg was an All-American college, won 25 national, North American, and world championships in seven different one design classes. He was a sailmaker for 33 years with North, and was with North One Design until 2010. When he left to take a role as sailing director of the College of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina. During uh, his eight year tenure at Charleston, the Cougars won four foul trophies representing which represents the best all around team in college sailing in the country, including the overall national champion. Um, as you know from the press release, Greg is going to be with us at all our regattas this, uh, this summer and into the winter. Um, he'll be, at the, he'll be uh, handling pre-regatta pre practices. He'll be running uh, daily uh, post-racing uh, debriefs. Uh, he'll be providing the, uh, the IC37 teams with, with as much uh, regular insight and in, uh, to how each team is doing on the water as he can. Uh, and he'll be available between regattas to um, talk to people about questions, handle, handle questions and talk a little bit about performance and what you can do better the next weekend. So um, a big welcome and, and a big thank you to Greg for uh, joining the team, joining the IC37 team and, and really helping pull together this webinar, which I think will be a lot of fun given the given we won't be on the water for a little while. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, the webinars. Um, this is the first. Uh, our hope here and, and aspiration is to do a, a webinar about every two weeks until we uh, until the well until we sail, which hopefully will be uh, sometime in the middle of the summer. Um, our plan is to um, handle, you know, the topics, everything from boat handling to sail trim, uh, boat trim, weight trim, uh, and probably get into some tactics along the way here at some point. The format will probably, uh, well, I'm sure we'll tweak it as we go along as we learn how to do these better, but the format will be gener generally the same. We'll try to involve a, a number of sailors for one particular boat, depending on the topic. Uh, we'll have a few experts and Someone will join Greg um, from time to time, and then some videos and pictures. And, and of course, we'll try to handle as many questions as you have uh, that come through the chat room or even after the webinar, um, happy to handle questions. And if we don't get to all the questions during the webinar, we're certainly going to try and answer those the best we can afterwards. Um, I think I want to take a short uh, opportunity here to update everyone on the class. Um, obviously, the big the big question in everybody's mind is the schedule, um, and I'm sure at this point, by everybody knows that we're pretty much under postponement, at least through June. Uh, I think we're going to hear about July shortly, especially the the uh, New York Yacht Club schedule. Uh, I have to say, I'm not optimistic about July, and quite frankly, I think we're hoping to be sailing by late August in, in regular regattas. That's our, our hope at this point. So we'll be running, we'll be running these webinars about every two weeks, um, probably sometime in July. Um, after the, the summer and then we get through the fall and hopefully the nationals, we'll, we'll have our Florida schedule again, our Florida winter series. And these are roughly, this, the regatta schedules up on the screen is roughly the same as we had this year. Uh, November 22nd, um, 20 to 22, January 29 to 31, March 19 to 21, and then um, something new and different and trying to expand the reach of the class. There's been a lot of interest in California, but clearly we, we sort of got to go out there and demonstrate the boat um, to, to, um, to move that interest forward. So we're going to be testing the waters with everyone about trying to do a spring schedule out in California next year. Cal Cup um, at California Yacht Club in the mid-April. And then San Diego Yacht Club Yachting Cup, May 1st and 2nd. 
and then an IC37 standalone regatta that Newport Harbor Yacht Club is, is, um, has offered to host uh, at the end of May on the 28th and 30th. And then of course, um, for those boats that will be out there, try to get back to uh, Newport for, um, for the majority of the summer sailing. Um, on also notables, Tech Committee has been meeting. Um, you know, the, the committee is meets from time to time and they discuss topics uh, that come up through uh, the sailors' suggestions about how to improve the boat, um, still keeping uh, with, the, uh, with the goal of still keeping the cost down and changes to a minimum. Uh, they've met recently and we'll probably see a few things go out to the membership for a vote. But uh, for the most part, it's just tweaks here and there. Um, topics include uh, changing over the uh, air vents that everybody knows and loves on the side of the boat that stuck out a little bit to flat vents, uh, improving the function of the jammer for the hobble, jib hobble, um, potentially deflecting the traveler line a little bit towards the center of the boat earlier so, so um, people aren't stepping on it, all you main sheet trimmers who can't get the the, the traveler to move after during the middle of the tack. We'll try to eliminate that. So there's a few odds and ends that uh, should be easy to change and, and we'll get to everyone and get those approved and uh, get a, a notice out to everyone so we can do it. And of course the club boats will be changed as soon as they're approved. So um, just a few thank yous here. I wanna thank Laura from North Sales who's moderating this um, and hosting this Zoom webinar, which has been great. And uh, they've done a lot, so they're very experienced. Mel just boat, boats for the video and, and editing support. And Ed Adams and Mike Marshall for the uh, videos that they've contributed to this particular topic. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Greg, who's going to introduce uh, our team tonight and uh, moderate uh, the discussion. Well, thanks, you, Greg. thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And, uh, and first, let me just say how much I appreciate the opportunity to work with the IC37 class and be a part of this great organization. I'm really psyched and uh, I look forward to the time when we're finally going to be able to get out on the water, but uh, I know it'll be a lot of fun. And obviously I have a lot to learn about the boat and um, that's why I'm especially excited about tonight to listen to David, Max, and Charlie. And I got a notepad here already to take some heavy duty notes, so it'll be good. But you know what is really cool about tonight is to have these three guys that sail on Pacific Yankee. Obviously they've done really well. They've done a lot of sailing together on a lot of different boats. So it's, it's gonna be neat to hear them discuss their teamwork and, um, and their style and their communication. But, but first we wanna introduce them and first thank them too for taking all the time they've, they've given to help prepare for this and given us the time tonight. But that's uh, David Dempsey there. I think he's on the top. He's our bow person. And David grew up on Manhasset Bay on a, and sailed on a variety of local Western Long Island race boats. He sailed in college at University of New Hampshire. He became heavily involved in many offshore one design classes, including the IMS 40, the MUM 30, the J109, Swan 45 and 42, Melgus 32 and TP 52. David also was engaged in several high-end custom IMS and IRC offshore and inshore programs sailing in the US Caribbean and literally all around the world. He's an inner dealer broker with ICAP. So he, um, he also has a job on the side. <laughs> um, Max Hutchinson is, grew up in San Diego and sailed collegiate at USC, both in dinghies and offshore. And I know they were, uh, cause we competed against them a lot in the offshore programs and they were a real force to reckon with. A friend of mine from San Diego told me that Max is the San Diego Yacht Club's go-to crew for all their many team race, match race, fleet race club events. Um, he's, he's quite the guy on the boats and uh, in high demand. And um, he has a first in the FAR 40 Worlds, fourth in the J70 Worlds, and second in the Invitational Cup with San Diego Yacht Club, and has sailed extensively in Etchells and TP52s as well. Um, Max, in his spare time, is a project manager and handles real estate and investment. So he's got a lot on his plate. And Charlie <clears throat> Smythe, I always have a lot of respect for sailors who grew up in the Gulf Coast youth sailing programs. Charlie started his sailing in New Orleans and Houston. And after working, working in the rigging, boat building, and sailmaking industries, he pursued a successful Olympic 49er campaign 
and just missed qualifying in the trials for London in 2012. He sailed with Johnny Goldsberry, very strong team. And then he turned his focus back on becoming a boat captain and he met Drew Freedies. And obviously from there, history is, is quite clear. They sailed a bunch together, um, went in two worlds in the Melgus 20 and then a world championship in the FAR 40. And interestingly enough, with Max on the boat with him. So I think that's kind of what makes this cool is that these guys have such a history together and have such a, um, you know, an, an interesting outlook on sailing together as a team. So um, really looking forward to it. And I got to say, it was cool listening to these three prepare for tonight's talk. What I took away is the consistency of their teamwork and their focus on clean communication. You know, obviously they're well practiced and we're going to learn a bunch from them. So thanks again, you guys, for doing this. And um, so we're going to focus on sets and jibes in this one hour webinar. And we're going to do our best to keep it to one hour. But like Phil said, there's a lot of great information here and a lot we can talk about, a lot of style, a lot of information. And um, if we go till midnight, you know, feel free to jump off if you need to. <laughs> yeah. um, but you'll see uh, David, Max, and Charlie have laid out their job descriptions in outline form. And there's a lot of copy on the slides. And we think that's valuable to have in there because this is being recorded as, as Phil said. And after this is over, and you guys may want to watch it again, watch the videos and hear their narration, you can actually see their job description um, agenda, if you will, step by step that they put together. And they put some time into it, as you'll see. But they're going to go through that. And then we have a handful of videos that we think are, are pretty good and are going to show quite a bit. We wish we had more videos, like we're missing a... Um, a jibe set video. But what we're gonna do there is after we go through the set videos, we'll stop and, uh, and David, Max, and Charlie will, will discuss um, a jibe set just like they would if they're standing at the bar. So that'll come kind of natural. But I think it'll be good. And, and um, the thing that we're gonna see too is um, there's gonna be a chat room that will open up. And I think you guys can see that in the bottom of your screen. And that will open after 10 minutes. And you can click on that and just load in your questions. Phil's going to get those questions. He'll be able to take a look at them um, and, you know, pose them to the game every once in a while. And, um, and hopefully we'll have time at the end to answer them. If we don't, um, like Phil said, we are going to make sure we get your answers to you. It might be an email or maybe the next webinar we'd start it off with it. But um, Anyway, I just know that we'll get back to you with uh, what these guys think. So just, uh, anything I miss there, Phil? I just want to repeat, if I didn't say it already, that this will be recorded and available on YouTube after. So um, for anybody who misses it. But, okay. yeah. And thanks again, right. Laura, for making that all happen. Right. Okay. So, David, I think you're next, or, and you're going to talk about your job on the bow there. Yeah, so I'm Dave Dempsey. I'm doing the bow in these videos on uh, Pacific Yankee. And just going to kind of lightning around through the steps here so we can get into the videos. Um, just starting before the weather mark, the approach, the communication that we're going to have uh, from the bow to the mast and pit and from the afterguard about what the maneuver is, straightaway set, jib set, jib up, jib down, traffic, um, quick jib, you know, whatever the, whatever the game plan is going to be and just making sure we're all on the same page with no surprises. Um, and hiking all the way around the mark uh, to the boats pointed, you know, back towards the offset mark and then get into the jobs. I think that's pretty important on these boats. Uh, stepping forward, we're going to see in the video, quick open of the hatch. I usually keep the starboard side dogged if it's lumpy and wavy, and that, you can undo that with your foot and your weight through the hatch. So that's a little easier than doing it by hand. Pulling the tack out onto the deck, and then uh, something I think that we do that's a little unique, just reaching around the head stay, grab that tack, and pull it out from under and droop just the tack patch, the heavy tack patch over the bow pulpit and leave it there uh, till later in the maneuver. Uh, and then going back to the hatch, pulling the clue out, make sure it's over the lifeline, hopefully maybe past the shrouds. Uh, so the foot's nice and stretched and holding the head and ready to sneak that halyard up. Uh, and then we get into the, as we get to the offset mark, the pull out hoist is all at the same time. We'll get into that a little bit more later. And um, 
you know, it, it tends to be a nice safe maneuver. It keeps the foot from being exposed uh, out into the water. And uh, that works you know, all the way up the wind range. And as the hoist goes, uh, step and pulling the sail out of the hatch, making sure it's smooth and uh, helping out the mass man by not having any friction. And then head running forward and uh, jib down if that's the call, making sure the spin sheet is free and high and getting the jib down quickly. Uh, the pit person may be ahead of me just to make sure that the top of the kite can pop and, uh, and then getting right into the downwind crew weight position is the next step. Okay, great. David, Max, you want to take it as the mass man? Absolutely. Um, so just kind of a few quick things that I make sure we're thinking about before the, uh, before we get there, just the countdown from the tactician is huge. Um, especially as the guy hoisting, you can't, it, it gets real bad if that doesn't happen. Um, hopefully the, somebody got the kite pulled forward after the uh, lured mark rounding, uh, ideally the smallest person. Uh, the skipper needs to make sure he gives you a big turn down and you'll see a good example in the videos to make the kite nice and easily, it'll fill faster. Um, good marks on your lines, particularly the halyards so that you can kind of either give a call as you're getting close or and a good mark to know that you hit the top and then making sure the conversation's been had about jib up, jib down. Um, we'll get you nice and covered. Um, so for my me specifically, making sure I hike as long as humanly possible, the boat will tend to flatten out pretty nicely around the marks or once you're around the offset or windward mark. So that'll make it be a pretty good sign for when you can go. As you're going, either before you get up or at kind of the first thing, make sure your windward sheet is uncleated and you get as much slack forward as you can. Uh, getting your next move as you go forward is to get the clue out of the hatch. If the bow person beats you to it, fantastic. But otherwise, getting the clue back as far as you can, ideally behind the shrouds and over the lifeline, will make your set a lot better. The trimmer can pull it back on his own at that point. And then once the bow guy is ready for you, starting the sneak and going in kind of the videos you'll see, we can, you can sneak pretty far in heavy air. You'll, it'll be a little more controlled, but you can get pretty nice sneaks on these boats. Um, I think, yeah, the next point will be the tactician will call, call the hoist for you. Hopefully at some point you get your big turn down and then a big made call letting the skipper know he can come back up. Immediately after that, uh, if it's the jib up, or if the jib's gonna stay up, you just go to flatten as fast as you can and get in your racing positions. If jib's coming down, uh, you'll help the, basically help make sure the clue stays in the boat. And then the bow guy can generally handle it for the most part from that, but making sure he's well settled and under control before you go back. Um, the drop lines tend to, get tend to come out tight so also pulling a little bit into that is uh makes a big difference uh, i think that's it for me right all right charlie you want to tell us about the pit oh, i think you're muted charlie. You're muted, charlie sorry about sorry about that my name is charlie Smythe, and i do the pit on pacific yankee um I also call the breeze while going upwind. Um, so, and I have a pretty loud voice. So I always try and be the relay between the front of the boat and the back of the boat and just kind of say things so that everybody on the boat can hear and that we're all on the same page. Um, so approaching the weather mark, one of the things that we try and do is also make note of whether or not it's a long or a short offset. Um, this really frees you up to, to do your jobs on the offset leg, or if it's a short offset, you can maybe be a little bit more rushed and maybe you have to do a few more things, um, before the weather mark. Um, so obviously hike as long as possible. If you have time on the offset mark to do all your jobs, then you try and get it in all on the offset leg. Um, I pull the tack line out. Um, I typically try and do this from the rail. Um, that way I'm directly in line with the clutch and I have a really good mark on there where I know to pull it. Um, and then I also try and 
when I take the jib halyard off the winch, I try and always do this after the weather mark because if you do it before the weather mark, it usually eases about an inch or two and that can really change the shape of the jib before. Um, and so if you have a, a really, you know, tight weather, weather rounding, you don't really want to change the shape of the jib before you make your bear away. Um, also on the offset leg, it's usually, we usually find out if it's going to be jib up or jib down. Um, heavy air, you stay outboard. This really frees up the cockpit so that the trimmers can get the winches loaded and um, keep everything organized. Um, the pit person pulls the pole out when the hoist is called. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the floater pulls the, the pole line when the hoist is called. Um, as soon as the spin is up, I usually dump the jib halyard 10 feet no matter what. Um, if the bow team is prepared for it, then I just let it fall all the way. But if they're not ready for it, I just literally open the clutch and then close it after about 10 feet is dropped. This really opens up the slot and lets the spinnaker fill. Um, and then I look forward and make sure that the bow team is ready before I dump it the rest of the way. Um, most of these jobs I'm doing while trying to look forward and not keep my head in the boat um, or looking at the clutches or the winches or whatever. I'm really trying to keep my head forward and make sure that it's everything is coordinated. Um, that's that's about it for me. Great, Charlie. Super. So we have uh, next. We have a video. Everybody, it's a great video of um, of Pacific Yankee and Phil Tulur going around um, the offset here in Hoiston. And um, what we thought we'd do is we'd kind of divide it up into thirds. Obviously, this first shot is aimed right at David, so we'd let him go. And then Max would talk about the mast, and then Charlie would talk about the pit. And Phil's able to stop it and start it. And, um, and yeah. we'll <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Hopefully. There we go. There we go. Yeah. So there, there it is. Pop the hatch with the foot. We'll back out just enough with the patch out and over the pulpit. And just leaving it there, not not extending the pole yet. It'll stay right there. It's nice and pinched in there. Go back and do the rest of the task. Get the clue out. Stretch the foot, and then get to the head. And we're ready for the hoist. Max. Hey, David. Can I ask something real quick? Yep, sure. Talk about because we see differences from boat to boat, and you guys are really big on getting the clue back. You even you say even to the shrouds if you can do it. Um, talk about how you're, what you're looking for and how far back and, you know, and you said sometimes even Max might help you with that. Did yeah, whoever can get there. It depends on the timing and the length of the offset. If I'm still finishing the front, he, he'll get to the clue. And getting it around the shroud, sometimes you can get stuck in that corner of the clue patch. So it'll run free and the trimmer will just be able to pull it right back and stretch the foot all the way uh, before the hoist is made. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Max, do you want to kind of yes. get into what you're doing at this point? Yes. And, and uh, maybe, me, Max, maybe talk about what you might have done, you know, if things had been a little different to help David out if need be, you know? Yeah, I mean, so kind of my general thought process every time is stay on the rail as long as I can as I go forward. Kind of my first move there is to uh, look at the clue. David happened to be there first, so I didn't have to touch it. Um, then I reached and went for the sheet uh, and got slack in a windward sheet. Generally, it's just a call back asking for someone to uncleat it, or you can do it if you're extra on top of it. Um, at that point, I think just kind of waiting and for David to be settled and ready at the hatch. Um, as soon as he's there, makes it easy and we can just start sneaking, which I think, yep, we're already doing here. Cool, cool. And Charlie, what's your role? Certainly you're calling a lot of the direction here, but what's your, what's talked about what you've done so far? Yeah, so you, you can kind of see how I, I stay weight out and I get the tack out. Um, I tail the tack out 
and then I do go to the middle of the boat here uh, because it is pretty light air. You can kind of see as we do our big bear away that we almost even come to weather just a little bit. And then Max gets to hoist really, really quickly here. We get a good sneak, um, really trying to look forward to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, if Max starts sneaking, then I'm, I'm trying to be prepared to make sure that I'm tailing uh, as quickly as possible um, to take that slack so we don't get behind. Um, and then as soon as the halyard gets made, I'm trying to get weight up as, as quick as possible. Yeah. Charlie, you, you, can I ask you something? You said that you like to sit out as far as you can, especially if the breeze is up and do your job from the rail. And, and obviously that's a huge advantage, but it sounds tricky. <laughs> yes. You, talk us through that, how you're, maybe how you're sitting and how your back feels when you're done with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, the, the clutches are at an angle, so they kind of at a, a 45 degree angle coming off the mass there. So if you can get really in line with the clutch um, and get the least amount of friction possible, you can kind of sit on your heels with your back up against the lifelines a little bit and pull directly from the clutch. And it, it makes it really easy to pull the halyard that way. Anytime that you get out of in line with the clutch, then you're just pulling way more friction than is need be. Um, so you can see here in this video, I've got one turn around the winch and I'm pulling directly from the winch so that it keeps it in line with the clutch. Um, so. And if it was blowing, you wouldn't be using the winch until? No, if it was blowing, I wouldn't be using the winch at all. I, if, <laughs> if you pull, you pull and pull and pull, I, I, I make, I, I lean on Max to be able to get it to the top. And if he can't get it to the top, then I directly go onto the winch and then grind it up the rest of the way. Gotcha. So <clears throat> interestingly, there, so there, there's a big swabble down. You guys have, uh, the hoist is almost all the way up by the time the boat turns down, um, which is, and, and all three corners of the sail are pretty far out. They're already extended, the clues back, tacks out, heads way up. So it's interesting how you get the bow down. Whoop. Shoot. Does that all the time? No, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, so I think while Phil gets kind of set up again, the, uh, I think Drew and Bill both have taken a little bit of abuse from me on uh, calling out to them to please get the bow down for the hoist. <laughs> um, the, if it's a very small thing. Uh, it There's feels like a small thing when you get it right, but when you get it wrong, it, it makes the job much, much harder. Um, if you can get the bow down, it's only for two to three seconds, just as you're getting kind of the last three to four pulls on the kite, and then you're good, your call made, they come back up and everything pops nicely, but getting that turn is amazing. How deep do you look for them to go, or you ask them to go in a nice way? Um, I think it, it's kind of breeze dependent, but ideally it'll be 10 degrees low, 10 to 15 degrees low of your uh, ideal kind of racing angle or VMG angle, I think might be the safe way to say it. Um, if you just, and it's I, I, almost so that as you're coming down. It's a turn right there, whatever yeah. that is. Yeah, yeah, it's almost to the point of weather heel. You can kind of see yeah. we get just a kind of little little bit of weather heel there. And as soon as the boat gets any sort of weather heel, Drew's already bring or Bill is already bringing the boat back up. Yeah, so um, the boat goes dead down and up. Yeah, because okay. if, you, if you stay, if you go any further to weather, you know, any more weather heel than that would be really bad. Boat slows okay. down too much and... Um, yeah. All right, should we move on to the next video here, guys? Uh, one more quick thing to note yeah, is that sure. on that one in particular, you can see originally David and I are kind of sitting waiting for the jib. Um, and then the call is made since there's a boat directly to lure of us to go for the roll. So David and I both left the jib, got went, hiked out for a little bit. And then uh, once the roll was good and we were back on our normal angles, that's when we went to actually get the jib down. You guys held there. Everybody's on the weather rails. There's a little bit of push, push down, yeah. and then 
then jib down. Then jib down. Yeah. And yeah. Nice. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and the other, the other thing to note with this hoist is that when if you're going to pull the pole out during the hoist, that there needs to be enough slack in the foot of the spinnaker that there's no resistance between pulling the spinnaker between the jib and the pulpit there. Like it makes it really hard if you pull the pole out with too much sail still in the boat. So David makes a, a big point to pull extra slack in the foot of the spinnaker. Not so much that it goes in the water before you pull the pole out, but that it the the person pulling the pole out doesn't have to fight the foot as it goes yeah. out. Well, so it can't look like it came out easy there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Let's uh, move it on here. Um, this one a little more of the same thing, maybe very uh, different hoists, different group of people, but. Again, I think it's important. We stop it right there. You guys have the head up here, the clue way back, tax on its way out. But but the, your point too, Phil, is it's not all the way out yet, right? It's like uh, yeah, I don't. There's nobody on the bow that has to stay with it, right? Right. right. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think that the the nice thing about the later pole, if if the sail's under control, is that your mass, your bow person can be back at the hatch, yep. helping helping yep. the other yep. corners. Attack with the foot. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. That that's a. And I would say the fleet. I don't know. Yeah, I've watched that much of the fleet go around the mark, but I would say most people probably have their poles out sooner than you guys do, and and pull the tack to the pole. You know, watching that, Charlie, that, that bear away while you're hoisting, that was a really good guide to where the boat went flat, you know, almost healed to weather. When you watch it. Yeah, that, that's that's something that we worked on in the, in the Mel just 20 for years was, you know, and no weather heel really, but just nice and flat. And it really allows you to get the spinnaker all the way to the top. And then you can kind of make a little bit of a... Uh, bring it back on the breeze after that mm -hmm. yeah is there is there anything so we've seen two of your sets here and we're going to get to another video on sets in a second but not not quite the same if it's blowing 20 to 25 it, will, anything different from what we've been seeing i mean the pole still a late pole pull pole is pulling the tack out the, you still get a pretty healthy sneak i mean that's always you, you the wrap how much can you control the head are you you doing half a sneak or what what do you what do, you, what do you do different and heavier? So say, like you said, same on the tack. Uh, I think it's safer than having it out and exposed. So that works pretty well and less sneak, a little bit more conservative. Okay. And the big swabble down. Yeah. yeah. And obviously the clue's still back, David, and you're trying yeah. to spread it out as much as you can. Yep. Sure. Okay. I'll move on to the next one here. Um, this is a little bit more about jib and shoot interaction. Um, So it's, it's 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 probably something we all look at and all all try to do on the boats, but but it, the, this video shows the difference um, between your what you guys do behind this boat and what they've done here. Um, we, maybe if you guys can pick on that, what what do you pick out the difference here? What did you guys see and do differently? Do you think? than other people there. I mean, just looking at the jib. I think it's a lot, not looking at the jib, but I think light, it's light enough air there that maybe that they did a little bit too big of a swabble. Um, you know, you, you, you can see them do a big bear away here and they get in the low lane pretty quickly. Um, but that was just one observation I just had. Yeah, I was going to say the jib really hasn't gone out here yet or anything's no. happening with the jib. It just goes out there and then the chute seems to respond. You guys, you get your chute up and I think almost pretty quickly, as you've said, your jib is on its way down. It's certainly out there and now it's on its way down and the chute yeah. responds quite quickly. Yeah, and I think that's a good example of one of the drops where uh, Charlie kind of double clutches the jib because you can see the jib will come down. It gets a big set of wrinkles for a few seconds and then starts coming all the way down. So 
I'd assume that we kind of got got our maneuver ready and, and went for the set. And then on the bow, we just weren't quite ready to get the jib on the on deck. So Charlie caught it for us. And then we yeah. went the rest of the way down. Cool. And then the chute fills. Jib's out, open there, and on its way down. Okay. Certainly opens up the slot real nice. Yeah. You know, it yeah. almost looks like on the lead boat here, too, the fact that they're the clue of the spinnaker wasn't maybe as far aft as yours had an effect on it filling as quickly, you know? Yep. That, that's got to be helpful. I agree with that. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think um, talk through jive sets just a little bit here. Yeah. Sure. I'll start from the front, I guess. Same, same plan with the tack. Nothing changes there. Maybe just a little bit earlier, again, going back to the planning before the mark uh, and, and timing and making sure that the, the tack gets done a little bit earlier so that there's enough time to get the clue out of the hatch and around the head stay. Um, that really makes, makes the maneuver go much smoother. And then it's into the, into the hoist, the head, bringing the head forward as far as possible. And then as the boat starts to flop, get all the belly material around the head stay during the hoist. So you're physically walking that clue forward. Yeah, yeah, okay. pulling around from the head stay. And let me ask you another question on the jib. Have you do you leave the jib pinned, or do you do you leave it to on the on the new weather side? It should flop on the hobble. Okay, All right. Yeah, and I think on the jib sets, kind of the biggest thing is actually the turn. Um, this the skipper watching where the kite is at during the turn makes the biggest difference. If he can get kind of dead downwind for an extra two to three seconds again, um, that makes a big difference to getting the kite kind of ready to go. Um, if you go and just kind of do the full swing through, the whole kite just gets stuck to windward and it's kind of a cluster. But if you can see the thing get made and see the clue starting to come back, it'll give you a lot more uh, forgiveness for anything going wrong there. Right. Where, where do you guys, at what point do you guys pull the clue down hard to kind of unroll the top, the head of the chute? Does it get pretty far aft when that happens? Yeah, I think generally I'll, I'll go through the hoist and then after the hoist I turn to start overhauling if the sheet didn't get back far enough already. And either the trimmer got the sheet back far enough um, or I kind of reach behind and pull the kite around and down since the cl clue will kind of be right behind me at that point. Right, you're still, because you're, you're on the starboard side, so the sail's right behind you as you're pulling that halyard up. Yeah. Or coming behind you, right, right. right and Charlie, you're, you're, I guess that tack and, the, and the, uh, the pole and the tack are coming out a little sooner on the jibe sets? Uh, the tack still gets made to the mark, but yes, the, the, the pole still comes out when the call for hoist is being made. Okay, um, so same thing. All right. Yeah, same thing. It's just I, I would say that it's the jib down. If it's a if it's light air and you're doing a jibe set, that the jib down. If you do it too early and the kite hasn't come all the way around the forestay and sort of filled on the other side, it could backfill, and right. and you could really find yourself in trouble around the forestay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it, again, it's it's trying to keep your eyes forward and up and not looking in, in the boat. It's really trying to be aware of, of what's happening and uh, where everything is. Okay. Would you almost hesitate to ease it out on a hobble like that, Charlie, to keep that forecast? Yes, yes. Okay. And I think even Max sometimes, if it, don't you sometimes pin it to weather if, if, it, if it need be? Like, um, so I, if I remember correctly, typically we'll leave it on the winch and it kind of stays on the winch to windward. No, that's not right. No, no because no. you need that winch. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, yeah, I think it'll be nice and tight on the hobble. I don't interact with that or with the jib at that mm -hmm. point. Okay. Well, maybe it's Serena that yeah. keep, keeps the, the hobble sheet pretty tight. Yeah. And then as the kite fills, she does a big dump on it and it, it flops over. Right. Yeah, right. that would make the yeah. most sense. Because I, I know a lot of guys talk about trying to keep that jib, if, if not pinned, at least sheeted so that jib yeah. 
goes around that goes around you know the head goes around the head stay it's guided by the jib around the head stay right yeah and i think making sure the jib goes out as soon as the kite's around is a big deal whether it's, yeah. whether it's a jib up or a jib down right. yeah okay. all right well i'm sorry we couldn't find a video of uh, jive sets there but um hope everybody's got the got a few pointers there um you want to go on to david talking about Jibes. Sure. Okay, so we'll move on to jibes. Okay. All right. So dive on the bow, pretty straightforward. You're already in your um, hiking position, your downwind hiking position, balls of the feet, weather side most likely, unless it's really light, and um, ready to go and tractor the kite back. Uh, first of the three people, we use three people on the boat, pulling the sheet back, uh, and I'm just aft of the shrouds uh, with the other two behind me. A um, little different for me on the bow, but to wear gloves on these boats actually helps a lot on, on pulling the kite around. <laughs> that took me a few jibes to figure out. Um, yeah, that's a, and uh, in heavier air jibes, just need someone to, um, you know, they, we're going to banjo the hobble probably to bring the jib in a bit going into the jibe and making sure that the clue gets pushed way out uh, to make sure the kite fills coming out of the jibe. That the jib isn't over trimmed, closing off the slot. David, who do, who do you think who does that on your boat? Who, the who could, loader is, is, I think, pulling the banjo in it in, uh, and then I'm pushing the clue back out. Okay. All right. Yeah. So for me, I'm kind of on our on our boat. I am the uh, puller of all things. So I go from mast, and then for the jibes, I go to kind of the our offside trim position. So I'm pulling the kite around on the winch. Um, a big thing for these boats is, as I'm sure people have seen, is making sure that you have your cross sheets crossed properly. Um, if that doesn't happen, it makes a really fun mess on the winch that I'm sure people have seen before. It, it's really unpleasant to deal with. Um, Whoever is doing that has a very important job and God bless them. Um, so going in the job, staying hiking as long as you possibly can. If you unload the rail too soon, particularly, particularly in breeze, it makes it really problematic uh, for the skipper. He can't keep the boat loaded properly. So hiking as long as you possibly can. Um, and then you kind of think of it as leading the turn with the kite. So the trimmer will be easing a little ahead of the turn. Um, you, cause you will never get the kite ahead ultimately by the end of it. If it's almost impossible, there's too much kite. Um, and then kind of the late main jibes will, uh, in kind of that right condition make a really big difference. Um, but anyway, sorry, I got distracted from my stuff. The, no, that's uh, right. no, that's good. But yeah, so for me, I'm just on the winch pulling as hard as I possibly can. Um, again, you're never going to beat this kite. It's too big. Um, the people tractoring make a big difference. The two versus three is, it, it really helps. It's almost, yeah, it, it's necessary. Because um, it, otherwise you can't get the right line speed to get the kite around quickly enough. Um, so then once you get the kite around, looking up, making sure that you get it eased back out to the proper position as the, the uh, skipper finishes off the turn and then passing it off and starting hiking. I call the flattens on our boat, uh, getting those squashes out of the end of the jives, particularly in the right, the uh, middling conditions makes a really, really big difference. So just going over, this is a little subtly different. So you're not the trimmer, but you're, you're on the winch for the new sheet. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I'm, the offside trimmer, so I tack the jib and jive the kite. Okay, so who's doing the release? The trimmer. The trimmer. Got it. Okay, so you're doing, and then you, then he grabs it and you run to the rail. Yep, he'll take it from me either if he's, or yeah, he'll take it from me at some point, hopefully after the ease, so that we don't kind of get on a step on each other. But he'll, yeah, right. I'll go ahead and start hiking. Got it. Got it. Okay. Next, and maybe, I'm sorry, go ahead, Phil. No, I was going to say, maybe, Charlie, is you, you can tell us a little bit about who, who the three people are on your boat that do this, because you got your, your mask guy doing the, the new sheet, not, not, doing the, uh, not pulling on the rail. 
So who yeah, are, and you get so who are the other two other than uh, other than David the bow guy? Yeah, David, and then it's myself. Um, so David's the front guy, and then myself. Um, I sort of position myself right above the turning block for the spinnaker, um, one foot in front and one foot behind. So I'm kind of in the same spot every time. Um, and then our floater, Serena, is the one behind us, behind me. Um, okay. And I think one thing we're leaving out here as well, like in Florida, we had our junior sailors. So even in Florida, we actually had four people on the, on the tractoring that now that I remember that, um, our junior sailor was in the mix as well. So it really, really trying to put a big focus on as many hands as possible. Um, and then big, big, bad Max pulling it, pulling it as well. I don't want to leave him out because he, he, you know, we're, we're assisting him, all four of us. He's the one who's really pulling it around. But yeah. Okay. Can, can I ask a real uh, basic question, you guys? Are your seats marked so you know right when the clue is at the head stay? Is that a... No. No. no that's, you just eyeball it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. Let's, um, we've got a little sequence here of, of another boat, uh, but it's a good sequence. And maybe you guys can talk a little bit about what you're seeing here um, versus what you do. I mean, it's the only thing you can really say. Um, and there's, it's a series of jibes uh, with Jim Wilson here on on their boat. And it's, a, it's quite a few set of, sets of jibes, which at least gets us to talk a little bit about who's doing what. And then maybe you tell us what you guys end up doing. Um, we start out here with these guys using the lured winches, which we, which they do eventually. This in, in the series of jibes go to a cross sheet, but um, so maybe we can get it to the point where they got are going to a cross sheet here. All right, there's a cross sheet. That looks like the trimmer has the um, pulled pulled that through, right? Trimmer's got the new sheet. Yeah, I, I think so. So we kind of figured out that, especially after a series of jibes, your trimmer's just going to get smoked. So you might as well have somebody, the person doing the uh, more physical part of it being the tired guy, so that being me, so that I don't, because I'm not trimming. So the trimmer will be fresh and able to do what he needs to do, and I'll get to recover in between. Because it, again, it's it's a monster and a full sprint getting that thing around. Right. So this is light air with jibs are down. So even with light air, you guys would have three people up there pulling. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I think you know, like one of their jibs is good crew weight. Maybe it's that one there, um, but it, it being consistent with the three people makes the crew weight happen. You get some heel into the boat and then a big squash, particularly in this light air here. Got it. Okay. Well, let's go back one more. So they have two. Uh, we'll get. Well, I think we go back the other way here. All right, here's a cross sheet. All right, the trimmer has got the new sheet. Two guys pulling. The uh, offside trimmer just goes to lower there. Okay. And so then just kind of a small side note, the uh, whoever happens to be closest to the clue when you kind of almost finish the jibe, making sure that they give a nice pull down yeah. on the clue is again really nice it helps snap the head through a little bit better right. um it gives it a little cleaner and it looks like on that last drive it happened for a second there but the uh yeah it's kind of just the little things clean it up makes it a lot smoother at the end right 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 is, okay. there a, is it easy for you guys to describe the timing as to when the spinnakers filled on the new lured side to when the boom comes over because i thought there was a little bit of difference there where the Obviously, the boom stayed to the old leeward side while the chute was filled on the new leeward side. 
um, is there a timing? Like here, it kind of came over at the same time. Right, I think back earlier, that comes over a little later. Yeah. Like yeah, here. so I mean, if, if you can get to the point where you're wing on wing for mm -hmm. a second or two, that's great. Um, it's pretty hard and the timing is pretty, it, it involves some very, almost a perfect jibe to get fully wing on wing there. Um, realistically, it's not gonna happen too much. If in a perfect world, I think kind of if your skipper can wait to come up from dead down wind at least until the clue is a little bit around the head stay, I think that's kind of a good general sign to watch for. Um, that'll mean that at least you'll have it back to some extent. Like on this one that just kind of rolled through, that was kind of more standard timing. The kite was around, but hadn't quite popped as the boom came over and then everything kind of filled at once. And that was solid. Um, but yeah, wing on wing is kind of happens sometimes if you get it just right. But I think the skipper can probably turn a little bit quicker if that's happening consistently. We'll, we'll get a good look of a job that does go pretty wing on wing. And I think one of the keys there was, was the main going out before the job as, as the turn yeah. down happened. So there's more, more aggressive on the main, I think helps to get to that wing on wing, but. Um, yeah, absolutely. All right, we're looking at. I think at, one um, of the things that lets us. Go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, one of the things that lets us get the extra people on the uh, tractor is that on our boats, the main chute trimmer will hold or will push out his own main um, kind of because he's close to it um, or reasonably close to it. So he can kind of control his whole operation by himself, um, which means that you don't have the floater holding the boom out, which is, again, an extra set of hands to get on the kite. I think we, before we go to the next one, we have one question. Um, who's the last person to go to let go of the sheet on a jibe, and what is the final move here? Clue down, aft, or just let it go around? So I think you answered this, guys, but just touch on it again. Looks like they sort of let it go. I think, yeah, the, the video we're just looking at, it, it, it looks like it's filling away from the person before they get a chance to do anything. But you guys talk, maybe just repeat what you guys try to do. You mean just the snap down at the end? Yeah, yeah. yeah just, just a quick pull as soon as the clue patch comes back to me, then it's just a quick pull down and aft. And, and you're probably always, the, you're, you're always the closest, right? Being the most forward yeah. guy. Yeah, and it just flops the head over. Right, right, right. So that's the, more or less the bow person's job. Okay. A lot of it has to do with the, with the actual load on the sheet as well. You know, like you're, right. you're sort of feeling it as it comes around the whole time. And if it's, if there's not a lot of load on it, then you can do a big snap. And if there's a lot of load, you might even yeah. abandon even trying to do a snap, you know? Yeah. But. Okay. Well, we've got a couple more jibes here. We can see some other boats um, jive and talk, look at the same thing. Here's a light air jibe. Um, looks like the Southern, one of the Southern boats. They only have two. And boom. Didn't look like much of a snap there on the on it, but it's kind of light air. Yeah, Other than the, go ahead. The comments we had on this one was the crew weight is really good going into it. It was a big push to starboard. Um, but maybe maybe a little a little squash might put some air back in the kite at the end. Right. Yep. Okay. And they got yeah. right, one person on the rail, but yeah. Right there, if you get the mask okay. to go up a little bit. Right. Okay. I think the other thing we liked about this too is that I, and I think this is Steve Benjamin in the back of the boat, but he he say, keeps everybody forward and he just does the, does the runners himself, right? He's just doing it himself there. But he's able to contribute to the role. Yeah, and that he's in the right, right. right spot for the role, right? Yeah, and he waits forward. Right. Okay. Anything else on this jive that, I mean, I know it's other than the two people pulling versus your three, any, any other similarities or, or, or things that are not similar to what you guys do before we get off this? Uh, just, uh, the, the turn is real. I really like the turn in this, in this jive, you know, you can see that right. he's, he, the kite has passed the force day before he's 
dead downwind, which really gives him the ability to turn the boat up fast and really get the kite filled on the new side. Yeah, yeah it was a nice smooth turn, right? It, it yeah. didn't stay down. It didn't there wasn't any segment to it really? Just just a turn, nice smooth right. turn. Yeah. So you're not surprising. Yeah. Okay. Your right. how important it is to kind of make that first part of the jibe kind of slow as you lay into it. Yeah. Heal it. Right. Now we got a little more breeze here, and this is from the Invitational Cup. I think it's Southern again. Um, jib up, jibe from a from a drone. Watch that again. You guys want to comment on this a little bit? Yeah. So I think the they do a pretty nice job getting the kite around. The uh, trimmer or whoever's releasing the sheet could have probably kept the clue a little bit tighter than the head stay. Right. Um, again, every foot he lets it go past is another foot that you've got to pull around. Um, and it also seems like they could have benefited from a little bit more of a hesitation, kind of dead downwind. The whole sail plan looked like it had flopped before the kite had gotten a chance to get too far back. Um, Huh? Jib's pretty easy there. Yeah. But not on the other side. It's actually quite tight. Yeah, that looked to me like they eased it going in and then trimmed it on through the jibe. So maybe that was a, yeah. a symptom of and maybe it got pulled through their hand as they uncleated it or something. Yeah, what's amazing is when they do, you can see almost see the spinnaker react when they do ease the jib on the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, making sure the jib comes out out of the jib fully luffing is a big, big deal for getting the kite oh. to pop quicker. It's it like medium breeze there for jib up. Right. Yeah, I th yeah, yeah, that's probably the other problem too. Okay. Do you guys, um, based on that, do you guys um, – Go jib down in 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 marginal breezes. Do you do you guys do that? Then put jib back up later once the boats settle down. Is that in your repertoire? Well, for the Invitational Cup, we did that for the San Diego team a decent amount. Um, you kind of if you got a nice set of breeze or a nice line of breeze, then you could pop it up and down. Um, as long as you're careful with the body weight through that having minimal people moving around you, it's you can get away with moving it a decent amount but it's got to be for a good reason um right. otherwise jib down is and marginal and stuff is just safer right okay why do you guys uh do you need to trim the jib in tight in the middle of the jibe on this kind of a jibe here is it are you worried about the battens on yeah the, the top of the jib will twist if you're not careful and just not and it'll catch on the through. kite Gotcha. Okay. Well, we go to the next. This is actually the last video. But two different jibes here, guys, right? We have the lead boat jumps out and gets away. The second boat takes its time. So we'll watch both of them. Then we'll come back and talk about them. All right, that is a that is a slow motion job. Okay. So it's a good example of an escape jibe or a no look jibe versus a pretty ideal jibe. Um, Southern, the boat who goes out first kind of has to snap it over so that they don't get slammed theoretically. Um, so you can kind of see that kite's not over as early, but that's kind of what they have to do to make sure that they get through safely. It comes out pretty well all things considered so 
it's kind of a good example, but having that no look jibe where you have minimal people moving early, um, it makes is a very nice trick to have, um, whether it be, or yeah, just have the tactician being able to say, we're going to sneak this or no look this or some variation of that. Um, is really nice to be able to get a jump on people in that situation. Yeah, and, and it does look like they executed that pretty well. Yep. This one is a good point in the main on the main ease. There's nobody holding yeah. that out; it just stays out there on its own. Yeah, that's yeah. a big e. That's you know, main's way out. It's pushing on the on the lured runner there. And when the boat comes out of the jibe, it's really balanced with the main not over trimmed at all, you know, it kind of allows them to slowly carve it up. And, and little runner on there, but he had no problem with his battens either, which is always nice. <laughs> yeah. But again, you guys, I mean, uh, oh, this boat does have three people. So boom. One, two, three. One of the f other boats we've seen, not everybody uses three people for sure. And again, jib down. So not the windy, not a windy jibe. Yeah, that looked like the tactician on, on that boat helping it around. If, if you're going to be that far back in the boat and help tractor, you really have to be careful of the boom because obviously the further back you are, the, the more susceptible you are to getting the boom in the head. Right, right. But you know, he's he's done. He's done before the boom comes over. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's what we got here, Greg, for videos. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you guys want to add? Or any other questions you have, Phil, at this point? I don't. Um, I think we hit on everything we wanted to hit on um, in terms of that that last job being a late main job and getting the boom out, you know, pushing the boom out first, letting it letting it go out there on its own. And then you don't have to nobody's holding anything as an air break. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we've covered everything we wanted to. Um, I don't know what we have for questions. Yeah, I think one one small side thing is that when the jibs in particular are reefed. And I think there was some discussion of if it helped if the mains were reefed or not. But when when you've got the reefs in the sails, watching the leeches of both of them on the kite on the jibes is a right. very big deal. Um, lots of kites like to rip on something up there. I don't know if it's been officially figured out what they're catching on. Um, but having a good eye up there in the big breeze, especially when the, the – uh, for or yeah, when the sails are shortened, it makes a big difference. Yeah, and again, I we we didn't get any video of you know good clean video um, of of jibes. We had a couple of regatta race days last year early on, and annual regatta I think, where we where we actually raced uh, one or two days or one one and a half days any anyway with a full full reef with with uh, spinnakers, and it was great. It worked out fine. But I, we didn't have any videos. Um, but it did, it does bring the leeches down. The profile of the leeches are both lower, and so you you've got to be a little more careful about, especially a jib. I think. Greg, I don't think we have any more questions in the, in okay. the box, do we? Well, good. No, I think, um, and we're just about on time. So yeah. hopefully, this is a good schedule for everybody. And uh, um, we could go to that the next slide and. And again, just remind people of the questions and, um, and that we're going to have another one, webinar two, Thursday the 28th. And um, again, if you guys end up with questions that uh, we didn't answer or we didn't uh, get a chance to answer, let us know because we will pick these guys' brains and get the answers for you. But if there's any, uh, anything else that we need to go over, this is a good time, but thanks for everybody setting us up and joining us. And Laura, thanks for getting North involved to help make this happen. And David, Max, Charlie, you guys were great. I know I sure learned a lot. And Phil, yeah. as always, thanks.
Yeah, thanks, well, thank Mike. you guys for having us. Thank thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. So next, yeah, next Thursday, just so just so people know, we'll we'll finish this. We'll actually get to take the shoots down and start up wind next time. So <laughs> so you you won't have to worry about sailing off to the sunset. We'll get the shoots down for you. That's the next move. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks yep. again. Yep. Bye bye.